Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so we might as well get started. Anyone else that joins us can probably hopefully play catch up. Um, so today's webinar is going to be about configuration manager in a cloudy era. So my name's Steve Beaumont. Helps if I can manage to click a button to do progress slides. There we go. Uh, it's my name, Steve Bowman. I'm product development director at Power On Platforms. So I've had far too many years in IT um, to want to recount exactly how old I am. I think this slide's probably out of date by now. Um, come from a background in local government, but I'm also a Microsoft MVP for my sins in the um, cloud and data center management arena. Uh, regularly do speaking, blogging, and I've been fortunate enough to work on a few books as well within my catalogue now. And there's another one to add to that list, which is the Orchestrator 2016 cookbook. Um, active on Twitter, you can find me at StevieBSC, and then there's the various different blogging platforms, even my personal blog or our company blog, where you can find relevant information. So. Just a very quick bit about Power On Platforms in case you've not worked with us before. Um, we'd like to say that we were formed from a collection of industry veterans. That's the posh name. What we generally tend to say is people that have been doing it for far too long and love it far too much. As you can see, we've literally written the book on System Center, including some of the other colleagues within the teams that have done uh, various activities with reviewing and uh, publishing on the books as well. Uh, we are an IT management and cloud automation specialist, so we don't just generalize in doing anything Microsoft. We're very heavily focused on actually what do we do with management tool sets, how we can do automation, how we can do DSC configs, how do we actually help you manage the actual underlying infrastructure and the clients within your estate. And then that being said, we're also very business led. So it's not always just about the shiny new toys. Not that I mind getting my hands on and playing with the new toys quite often, but it's actually what value do they give us as an actual organization? What are they going to enable us to do as a business to actually deliver better services or reduce costs? Oops. So, this afternoon's webinar is going to be focused around some more of the integration that Microsoft have been doing with System Center Configuration Manager and the cloud options and the cloud services that we can now start to interact with. Now, Config Manager is well known as being the industry leading standard for device management. So, I'll open up questions later. Uh, I'll bring you off mute so you can ask questions. Feel free to type them into the uh, chat panel as we go along, and we'll try and answer them as we're going. But presumably, most of you will be aware that, yes, Config Manager can absolutely handle workstations and servers. There is the mobile device integration, so managing things like your Windows phones, your iOS, and your Apples, and so on. It can also manage Mac OS and Linux as well. So there's a broad range of things that Config Manager can manage. But we're now seeing that Config Manager is always evolving now that we have this current branch uh, mentality in terms of updates. We're no longer in this old model of, fine, there's a release in 2007, you might see a service pack come along, then we have to wait for 2012 to come along to get another big update. We're now seeing consistent improvements that are almost quarterly aligned, they kind of vary a little bit but we don't have that moniker of a number version at the end of it in terms of a year. So we don't have Config Manager 2016 anymore. What we do have is Conf uh, System Center Configuration Manager. Current branch version 1511 came out, and it was 1606, uh, 1602, 1606, 1610, 1702, 1706. So almost every four months we've been getting a large update, no longer just dribbles and drabs of features. It's also important to know is that client management is actually changing. One of the biggest things is we're seeing more and more that devices are no longer contained just within your local LAN. We don't have a series of desktops now just tied to an ethernet cable. Laptops obviously came in, I started to see a lot of roaming. We used to bring them back either via direct access or VPN connections to be able to manage them or pray that users would come back in quite often. Now we're seeing an even more heavier slant to people working remotely. It could be either sat at McDonald's, it could be sat at home, or even using their own personal devices and how we start to manage and deal with them. So on this current, uh, current branch model, I mentioned all these different um, versions that we've had so far. So I've not included the 1511 release because that was like the first new major one past the 2012 R2 release. 
but we started to see new bits being introduced. Now, I've cut down the massive list of features that have been added and concentrated more on where we're starting to see that integration with some of the cloud additions to the um, solution. So 16.02, we started to see this integration with the Office 365 client management. So this is specifically the click to run um, application for Office 365, so Word, Excel, etc. That was usually is kind of like a bespoke um, app V package, but updates were delivered just directly from Microsoft on top of that, and you didn't have much control over it other than starting to use group policy to restrict it to downloading updates from a file share. We can now do some of that management within Config Manager itself, which gives us more granular control over which collections we're targeting and so on and so forth. Conditional access was added in. This was great. It means that we can start saying, well, if this device is managed via Config Manager, then it's allowed when it is roaming to access stuff outside of our network. We must be able to enforce things like it must have MFA if you're accessing X, Y, and Z. So making sure that uh, previously it was just only if it was an MDM managed device could we add to conditional access or whether it was a um, controlled by your user security account. Now we can actually say, well, depending on the device health, the config manager knows about. Now I've put enhanced MDM across just about all the different versions because it has so many features, it just didn't make sense to even start to try and break them down. So whereas before we were kind of seeing Intune was um, getting all the new features first, it still does get all the new features first, but then Config Manager 2012, we were heavily reliant on them doing a fairly big update just to get some of the features. We're now seeing just about practically all the features coming across each time and getting more and more parity with the standalone Intune service every single time they give us some updates. Now, that was a very small minor release in 1602, and then we started to see some quite interesting things coming along. So 1606, we got this OMS connector and the Windows Store, uh, store for Business integration. So for those of you that have seen um, Windows 10, you're aware it has a store. You can go and download your solitaires and your Angry Birds and stuff from it. It wasn't really set up uh, to handle well if you wanted to start uh, taking down volume license purchase of store apps to distribute. With the connector in for um, Configuration Manager, we can now start start to license these on bulk and deploy them via Config Manager. So we can even skip past the bit of having to have users go and search for them. We can control and curate and distribute directly from within Config Manager. And we can see the license counts and what people's using. The OMS connector is a good one because it starts to upload all your information around things like collections to the operations management suite. So Operations Management Suite is a log analytics platform, and it has a range of different solutions. One of them being around things like patching, where you can start to um, define out your patch collections, mainly focused around the server side, but it can help if you take some of that information out of Config Manager, where you've already designed your collections, you've got your different types of servers, it just saves you having to recreate that yet again in another solution. And then 16.10 brought in this cloud management gateway, which is one of the biggest topics we want to talk around today. So the cloud management gateway was this idea of, well, how do we start to make it easier for these clients that are roaming out on the net to connect back in for management without having to require tunneling back through DMZs, doing that reverse proxying and so on, and being able to actually have clients come in via VPNs. So we'll talk about that in a little while. Uh, again, they start to continuously enhance and improve. So we got even more Windows Store, uh, Business Store integration. Same that rolled through into 1702, where we got even more integration with it. So we can do lots of funky things now in terms of um, the license counts and seeing how many we've got deployed and stuff. And then we actually got the another Office 365 one. So while we could start to patch and maintain the ones that were deployed out, Rather than having to even manually build the application in the first place, so the traditional way was you got your Office uh, 365 click to run setup.exe, you built out an XML file that specified everything you wanted, you ran a command line switch to drag down all the content, and then you had to maintain that yourself. You can now start to do this from directly within the actual um, Config Manager console. So there's now a nice little wizard that you can step through and say, I want these components, I want it on this type of licensing scheme, these languages, go and Config Manager will do the creation of that XML and the download of the content, stage it as an application, so you're ready to start deploying. Again, more enhanced MDM. Now this was the trigger point for me wanting to do this webinar, and that was the 1706 release. This has literally just come out, it's been out for now probably three weeks, 
Um, so everyone's just starting to get their head wrapped around it. But that brought in some really cool stuff. So we got Azure Active Directory Discovery for a start. So for them organizations that have got a mixture of both on-premise and cloud native um, Active Directory accounts or Azure Active Directory accounts, or even for those organizations that are not running Azure Active Directory on-premise, which is a little bit difficult if you wanted to use Config Manager because you'd have to have it, but you can start to now discover them and bring them in. You might have pockets of your organization where they're only cloud first focused, and then you have your internal one, we now have a bridge and an integration method to go and find that. And it also enables some cool scenarios, which brings me back to the cloud management gateway, which got an extra improvement in 1706. And that's the ability that rather than relying on certificates to authenticate your clients to the cloud management gateway, we can now use Azure Active Directory authentication. So that has got some real, really interesting scenarios, and we'll cover them. So a couple of other things that were in there, um, they were partially kind of implemented beforehand, but 1706 has started to consolidate um, what we now call um, the cloud services connectors. So it brings in uh, the Windows upgrade analytics and update readiness. So if you've not seen Windows analytics, this is a free service from Microsoft. It's part of the OMS suite. But it allows telemetry data from your Windows devices to be uploaded to Microsoft Vortex system to be able to actually go in and analyze that. And it can start to do things like say, hang on a second, we can see these devices, they're running these applications, that application is not compatible with Windows 10, that's got some drivers that are faulty, oh, that one's okay, that's got some IE sites, and it can start to help you plan your Windows 10 migration. What we can do now with Config Manager integration is A, not only control the actual deployment and the enabling of that feature for the upload to the service, but also start to drag some of that telemetry back to the console so we can see what it actually looks like. And the update readiness is more about looking at the actual um, cumulative updates that you apply to your Windows 10, making sure that they're generally being applied correctly and whether you're missing any. Which they've now kind of wrapped this under conf uh, common configuration experience. So before it was a bit bitty, they kind of introduced one, right? You do it this way, and then here's another one, and you kind of do it this way. We now have a single management interface for actually setting these up. So as I mentioned, cloud management, that's the bit where we can start to do that um, Azure AD integration. So we can actually look at what users are out there, go find them. I'm going to show you that in a second. OMS connector get some of the uh, data synced up like collections to log analytics to enable some of the update management scenarios or just generally reporting. Upgrade readiness, go and see which ones can actually go up to Windows 10, which ones need some work. And then we've also got that Windows store for business integration so we can pull down the information within your private stores. So let's have a look at what some of these look like. So hopefully you can all see my config manager environment. So I've landed under the administration cloud services Azure services pane. You see I've already set a couple of these up, but normally it would be a case of doing the configure the Azure services and then choosing the one that you want to actually go and configure. Now the cloud management, as I say, is the Azure AD piece. Now if I just type something in here and go to the next one, this is how Microsoft have chosen to get this stitched together in terms of Config Manager on-premise being able to go and interact with your Azure services. So we're utilizing something within Azure Active Directory known as um, Azure Active Directory Apps or Enterprise Apps. So we need two specific applications for most of these. There is a server-side app. So this is the one that Config Manager uses for going and querying um, APIs, etc. And then the native client app is how clients on the outside start to communicate in and check and authorize and have the information they need to be able to tell Config Manager how they want to interact with it. So thankfully, you can do all of this lot from within the actual Config Manager console. So when you go and do a browse, if you've not got one already created, it's just a case of stepping through the wizard. Now, a lot of these are just completely free open text. There's no definitive structure that you have to actually go and put into here. There's nothing new that you have to go and learn from documentation standards. What I would say is kind of keep it logical. So I've been using for my app friendly names, things like config manager and oh, I can type neatly and then what type is. So this would be obviously focused on the client app side. The reply URL is for 
all intents and purposes, it is just unique to yourselves, but it has to be in a URL format. It doesn't have to actually resolve to anything, but try and keep it as your company names. Works on the basis of you must have um, administrative access to the actual environment that you're going to be setting these up in, but by signing in, it will bring back the information it needs in terms of your AD tenant names and if I can learn to click, AD tenant names and the subscription IDs. So I'm not going to go much further than just signing in to show that it pulls back my AD tenant name because I've already created this one. So you see it recognizes what um, Active Directory membership I'm part of, but Azure Active Directory membership and pulls it back forwards. So if I show you very briefly what that looks like inside Azure Active Directory, here we go. We can see that underneath Azure Active Directory, we have this app registrations pane. Now I've filtered it down to just the config manager just to be able to show you this, but this is in effect what config manager will then go and create. Two little applications that you can then go and use to talk to the environment. So we can see we've got one with the information that I entered, so server app with the URLs and specific application IDs. Now, if I go back to the one I created earlier, we can see that we have this Azure AD service. Now, there is presently no synchronization that's happened. Now, I set this up the other day, and I'm thinking, well, why is this not actually run anything yet? And I've been spamming run full discovery, and then I noticed that my log is nothing but a sea of red. So it's one thing that's really important to point out that when you do set it up via the Config Manager console, you do need to manually go into Azure Active Directory and do one remaining thing. And that's go into the actual applications and just say grant permissions yes. If you don't do that, you'll end up with a sea of red like I have and not a lot works. Let me do the same for my client app. Grant permissions grant. There we go, I can park that one for now. So now if I tell it to go and run a full discovery, we should see it will kick in in a second and it will go and discover all my users within Azure Active Directory. I'll give that a second or two to kick in and come back to it. Now, as I mentioned, we've got these two other services, the Operations Management Suite and the Windows Store for Business. I've not got the upgrade analytics in place within my environment because we're mainly a Windows 10 house, or we are a Windows 10 house, so I don't necessarily need to know whether I can upgrade to Windows 10 or not. However, the Windows Store for Business, just to show you the type of integration that gives you, if we have a look now under our software library, you will have this license information for store apps where you can see a raft of different applications now. So this is stuff that I've gone through the Windows Store for Business and assigned as I want to be able to publish this without users um, going and purchasing it. A lot of these are unlimited because I'm a big fan of free, so I'll take anything that I can that's free within the actual stores. But I now have the ability to not only just see it within Config Manager in terms of licenses, etc., but I can also go and very quickly create an application to publish out Windows Store apps without having to go and manage it outside of Config Manager. Have we got that kicking in yet? No. Let's see whether we've got any users. I know I've got a hybrid count, not yet. Right, we shall come back to that and see whether we get any update from it when it comes through. So that was the first couple of bits. So yes, we have um, the Azure AD integration now, so we can pull back all the different users. We have the OMS integration, the Windows Store for Business, and the upgrade analytics. So on-premise config manager reaching out. The other interesting one was this cloud management gateway. So this is the bit that starts to enable some of these interesting scenarios. So let me come back to that one and talk about it. So traditionally, when we've been looking at having Config Manager reaching out to these clients or having these clients reaching back into us, we've either had to rely on just having the clients with a VPN connection in, so they're coming through and into our internal on-premise LAN for all intents and purposes to talk to our primary site, or we used to have a look at what roles we would put up within the DMZ 
start looking at how we heavily secure them with SSL certificates. So setting up an internal PKI environment, doing the relevant certificate templates, because there's about four or five different templates you need to custom create for doing config manager with internet-based or HTTPS-based um, client management. We then obviously had to have these sat in the DMZ, but even though they were sat in the DMZ and the most preferred method for most people is having them in a work group within the DMZ, they have to be Azure AD joined servers to be used for config manager. Now that could either be Azure AD joined to your internal domain, which is kind of a little bit, mm, do I really want internal domain members sat in my DMZ? Or you'd have to have a new forest within your DMZ, have them joined and either have cross forest trusts if you want to do user-based uh, policies, or you could just have um, no trust, but you'd still have to have them domain joined and use accounts to go and manage them. Long story short, you'd need a set of infrastructure. Now, I've put three different servers in there. They could be a combined role, but you get the point. You needed to have very distinct roles within the DMZ for these clients to then connect in via SSL to talk to these ones, which would talk back to the internal primary sites. More than doable. It's been a scenario that has been done quite often for, since I dare really want to say the 2007 config manager days, but it was, um, but it's not really evolved in a massive way since then. However, that's where we start to talk about evolving it. So doing this change with the modern management way, looking to have the cloud management gateways in place means that we don't necessarily need to rely on that DMZ infrastructure. So the cloud management gateway actually stands up as um, a cloud service within your Azure subscription. Communications back to your primary site are only done realistically outbound. So it will go and pull and bring information back. So you don't need to have ports open across the link back into your data center. As long as your primary site can basically talk out on the um, an SSL channel on 443, then you can utilize this scenario. However, that was the only major change difference, trying to eliminate some of that infrastructure on premise within DMZs that you have to manage and moving up to a cloud-based service up within Azure. You would still need to have your active directory, so I put WSAD, so Windows Server AD joined, with certificates to be able to talk back to these connection points basically acting as a proxy role, which will then uh, have the information flowing back into your primary site on premise. Now, I've also put this other one that I've not mentioned so far, which is the cloud distribution point. So it's all right having something where we can send out policies or let clients go and poll for policy requests um, out on the internet. However, one of the biggest fe uh, features of the Config Manager is being able to deploy stuff. So we can move the content deployment role, so the distribution point, into a cloud DP. So again, clients are only connecting out to a site on the internet rather than having to tunnel back through and internally to get that content. Now, the change that we saw that was made in 1706 brought in this scenario. So this is where, again, we can keep it as it was, but now with this Azure Active Directory discovery feature, we can start to look at pure Active Directory joined devices being able to communicate in. So you can think of this in the fact of if you took a PC, went out to PC World Now, bought a laptop, took it out of the box, turned it on, one of the very first out of box experiences that a user gets presented with is do you want to log in with your corporate email address and password? Which at that point, if your uh, Azure Active Directory is configured to allow users to enroll, it will enroll into your Azure Active Directory. It still remains as a work group style device, but uh, some of these certificates and stuff downloaded from Azure, so it does uh, management certificates um, from that side, but then the actual Azure credentials, so your corporate credentials that synced with Azure, can be used to authenticate against the cloud management gateway to allow Config Manager agent to come back in and get policies and software distribution. So it does remove the need to have SSL certificates on clients. We have a great big asterisk on there, a little small print of in some scenarios. So while I've been testing this over the last few days, I've tried to draw up a matrix of what I've been finding does and doesn't work. So we found that out of box experience, a device in work group that is Azure AD joined does not need a certificate to work. 
you can put a certificate on it and it still absolutely works. However, we found some interesting scenarios where if the accounts are synchronized, so with a pure Azure AD account, works fine. We've seen ad hoc results when it's an AD Connect synchronized account. So on-premise created, synchronized into Azure AD. I've put doesn't work. I probably should have put needs more testing because we saw it was working sometimes then it kept on falling in and out. However, the interesting thing was though is when the device is already domain joined, doesn't matter if you register it with Azure AD or you have a cloud-based user logging onto it, which they can't if it is just purely a cloud-based user, it has to be an AD Sync uh, connected um, user because then it's basically you're logging on with your internal credentials before you take it on site. We could not get that working without a certificate. So domain joined devices, you would still need to have a PKI system in place to take full advantage of this. So what does that start to look like? So cloud management gateway, I don't have one in within this environment because I just wanted to run through very quickly and show you some of the things that you need to be aware of when setting this up. So let me just open some information. So cloud management gateway sits down here. It is as easy as going through and entering in some details into a wizard. Now, I'm not part of the US government, so I'm not gonna be able to choose that one. I'm just utilizing the, what they class as the public cloud rather than the um, secretive government clouds. Um, you do need to have what's known as an Azure management certificate. So this certificate doesn't have to be a public certificate, doesn't have to be anything special. You can create one yourself. Um, or use one from your internal PKI, doesn't really matter. As long as you have the CER version uploaded to Azure, and then you utilize the PFX version at this point. So what you're basically saying is, here you go, Config Manager, use this certificate to go and talk to my, act, uh, my, Azure, uh, my Azure subscription. Let this validate it. So obviously I've done that beforehand. Choose a region where this is going to be deployed. So I'm going to stick into the North Europe region. Now, you cannot enter a service name for this at this point, because this is a very important thing to know. You must have a certificate which has a publicly resolvable DNS address in it that you're going to utilize for this instance. Now, you don't have to have a public certificate. I have generated one for the purposes of this example through my internal PKI, but I've still given it a publicly resolvable DNS address. So my clients are gonna be looking for HTTPS, cmg.poweronplatforms.com. That will define your service name based on the prefix of your certificate. You can use a wildcard certificate, but only if it has a subject alternative name in there with a prefix on it. If it's just a blank wildcard certificate, it will not work because it will not give it a service name and your service FQDN. So if I was using startup power and platforms, it would just be powerandplatforms.com, which does not resolve to anything. Because I'm using an internal certificate from my um, internal PKI, I do not have my CRL lists publicly accessible. So you must make sure you untick this. Now the preferred method is to use a public based certificate. In another environment that I've got where I've got it up and running, I used an externally published certificate, which is great because it means then devices that are not part of your domain, that don't have your uh, root CAs and your issuing CA certificates can utilize it. If you're using an internal PKI certificate, you must put your certificate root CAs onto the actual devices first, otherwise they will not trust the SSL. Now, in saying that, you must also upload your internal um, issuing certificate servers to the service. So make sure you put, if you have multiples, your um, primary route and your issuing CAs in the right categories. Now, before I continue, I did just put in here a single VM instance. So if you want to start bringing in for production, you should have at least two for high availability, and then you can scale out depending on the number of uh, devices you need to support. Each one is roughly around about 2,000. We say 4,000 devices is the starting point because you should have two for HA, and then scale up from there. 
do note that while I said earlier it only needs port 443 outbound, if you are deploying multiple instances, you need some extra ports opening. So it starts at 10124. Every one that you add, you'll need 10125, 26, 27, and so on. We're only going to go with one for now. The rest of the screens are basically just giving you some alert capabilities. So start to tell me if I'm transferring more than five gig. Uh, 5,000 gigs, so five terabytes, let's actually knock that down. Tell me if I'm transferring more than 500 gig and give me my thresholds. Review summary, and then off it'll go. So that will start to now stand up a cloud service within the Azure platform for you to use. Good thing is, this is designed to be very lightweight management in terms of infrastructure. You don't have to worry about them cloud services. They will be maintained, all the configuration, the um, updates, uh, not updates for the OSs, but updates for the actual um, settings and stuff you do will just be done via Config Manager. So you don't have to log into the portal and start configuring anything. There's nothing to log on to them servers and go and install. Now, if it's quick enough, I should be able to find it within my Azure subscription somewhere. He says not being able to see it yet. Probably a little bit too quick for it. We can come back to it. But what does that look like once that's enabled? So I have two VMs. Let me bring them onto screen. I have this lovely VM and this lovely VM. So I've got a completely brand new fresh VM. So this is literally installed off the ISO media. No configuration has been done with it. It's been turned on and I've been dro basically dropped to the um, initial out of box experience screen. So if I go through these first couple, we'll get this process started. So which languages am I in? Yes, let's do it for United Kingdom. Don't want to add a second keyboard layout. Let it go and check for any updates. While it's doing some updates, I shall flick to this one. So this is a server that I've already got onboarded. So I wanted to show you briefly what it starts to look like. So when you first log a PC on, yes, it might join into Azure Active Directory. You still need to get the Config Manager agent onto the box. So there's not a magic scenario where it's just going to go, oh, fine, I'm going to connect to the Cloud Management Gateway and download all the client. It's not as if it's internally within your network like a domain join where you can do client push. So you could either manually go and install the client, or you can start to look at some interesting scenarios where you can utilize things like Intune to do that initial drop of the agent and get it up and running, which is actually what I'll show you on this side. So once you have the agent on board, though, Oops, don't want software center. You'll notice, there we go, we have the config manager agent in the control panel like we normally do. Now, I've hard coded this to say, you're only ever gonna be on the internet. Your work group device, even if you're coming internally, you're not gonna be talking properly through to our um, environment. And notice that because this is using an Azure AD um, user, that this has got a self-signed certificate, so it created its own when the agent was and stuff was installed, but it's not using any of my internal PKI certificate servers. We get all the usual actions, etc. We've been assigned to a site code because I did that as part of the command line install of it. But interestingly enough, when we have a look at the networking side, this is the URL as such. This is the management point, FQDN, of my internet facing one. So that's my public URL for that cloud service. Not the one I've just created, obviously, because that's still building. Right, let's just log on to this one quickly while we're here. So this one's going to be run by optim, Optimus Prime at System Center. Ninja. Can't type System Center dot Ninja. So obviously this is my test environment URLs. So all this has is an internet connection at the minute. I'm authenticating against Azure Active Directory. This is now logging me onto the device. It's gonna go through a couple of setups. I just realized that I have multi-factor authentication enabled, so it's going to actually pop up and ask me in a second. Alternatively, I can learn just not to be able to type a username and password. I 
really? Optimus. Let's try it with a different user. The Pope. Notice I'm using the default dot on Microsoft.com address. And that's a complete fail at that point, is it? Let me give it a restart, see what happens. Uh, back to this one while waiting for that one to reboot. So we have things like Software Center. So this is onboarded. It's got policies flowing down it. You can see we've got some task sequences. We've got some applications. But this is completely non-domain joined. You can see that if I run the whole um, DS reg command, that yes, this is an Azure AD joined device, but it is not domain joined. You can see that it's got all the registration IDs and stuff for it for Active Directory, and we can still do things like pull down software within it. So that allows us to do things like install. See, I've already installed things like Adobe Reader and stuff via the task sequence. We can manage that client. We can pull inventory back off that machine. We can even if I find it within my test environment. So this one was named desktop OUI. There it is. You see, we can even see the status that it's currently online and I can even go and do things like send out, if I bring up the right collection. I should be able to go and initiate client actions from internally. So I can say, well, fine, go and download with computer policy, and we'll see the actions and stuff actually happen on the client itself. Now, in terms of this one that's not working, let me just drop its internet connection because I've had issues before with VMM and it decides to move host and not reconnect back to the network. Should see its network connection drop. Good. And give it back a network connection. Try that again. And now we have connectivity. That's better. Right, so while that's busy just logging on, get all that lovely Apex packages and all the really useful store applications like Adobe Photo Express. This is one of the main key logs to go look for. So actually on your client devices now with 1706, you'll start to see this adult operation provider log. And this is where you'll start to see this machine talking out and across into Azure Active Directory, getting its tokens, and it's that token it will then use for going and communicating back with that cloud management gateway. So it doesn't need to have certificates, just uses that. Let me just skip past, not skip past, but let me just get past the MFA authentication. So this is one of the new things that's usually on by default within an Azure AD subscription. You'll find that it's set up to use next-gen authorization, which includes setting up multi-factor authentication so you can set up a PIN and store it securely within Azure AD. So there we go with that. Yep, you can see that that token just expired on that other device. So if we give this a new PIN number, okay. Perfect. So that one just expired its token. It's now going back through again. Right, this is the one that I'll focus on in a minute. Right, so we've got a pin set up. So this is brand new, fresh out of the box, had a bit of a networking problem, but that's it. So user logs on. Yes, fine, I'm connected to an internal network. OK, 
get rid of these new features. What's this about? Languages, don't really care about languages, go away. Now, what we should start to see though, is because this device is enrolled within Azure Active Directory, I've set that uh, Active Directory to actually utilize, here we go for show this bit, I've set it to utilize the auto enrollment within Intune. So that's not to say that I'm gonna fully manage this device purely and only in Intune, what I've done, if I can try and balance these on both screens at the same time, so you can see when it pops up. What I've done within here is I've set up a new mobile application. So within here, I've actually created an application. I've created an MSI to basically wrap the Config Manager agent. And we use this to push it down to users that have enrolled their devices in Intune management. So we're getting a two-fold approach now. We get a device that signs in with the Azure Active Directory credentials. It automatically joins Azure Active Directory. It automatically enrolls in Intune device management. And then we push down the Config Manager agent with all of the settings. Um, to join and talk to our cloud management gateway. So I think this messed up slightly with me pausing at the front screen with no network connectivity. It'll probably catch up in a second. Intune does have a three minute uh, policy refresh. So depending on where you are when you actually log on, it can pop up, pop up anywhere between right at log on and three minutes later. But we'll keep an eye on that one. But we should see that come through and pop up. If there's any doubt, you can go and check the event log. And you just know the demo gods are not gonna smile favorably on me today. This is where we probably find out it didn't correctly join the Active directory. No, nope. it looks like with that hiccup of the network dropping out, it failed to do its registration. Easiest thing to do, check. So we do it earlier. You can use DS reg cmd for slash status. So we are domain joined. It's just taking its time. Beautiful. We'll see if that comes through in a minute or two. So we are literally just on the nose for time. Um, I suppose there's nothing more really for me to say apart from open it up for questions. Do we have any questions that are currently in the chat at all? Let me see. No. Uh, yes, there is, sorry. Hi there. Let's see if I can expand that. Will the recording be available? Yes, yes it will. That's as long as our internal colleagues just remember to press record on the beginning of it, then it should absolutely. Any other questions that anyone has? If you do want to come off uh, mute, uh, let me know in chat and I can start to unmute people. Let me see whether that's kicking in yet. No, that's not kicking in. That's really annoying. Right, beautiful. So a couple of next steps. Now, obviously, if 
any of this does look of interest, especially enabling them scenarios where you might have either that um, idea of, well, we don't want to wait now for a uh, new user to have to go and get an IT issued laptop. We can go and get them to get, if they get any device, onboard it for management. We can strip off then via policy control and stuff, uninstall applications, install applications. We can even use config managers to go and deploy things like the VPN configurations, etc. Wi-Fi profiles, where you can basically take control and to, um, configure an out-of-box experience or just generally if you have lots of roaming clients you don't want to have to maintain and manage some of the things like VPNs or DMZ environment infrastructures. Things like Microsoft planning vouchers and stuff if you do have that then they can be used for uh, doing actual dis uh, discussions around this coming in looking at the environments deciding how these type of things could be utilized then planning scenarios and then we do do these webinars quite regularly. So this is just one in a long line of stuff that we do. If you also have a look at our website and our YouTube channel, you'll see some of the other recordings from previous uh, webinars that we've done. And please do help yourself to that information. Well, it leaves me with nothing more than other to say thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. And I shall see you all again very soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>